Look, a huge warm welcome to all of you who, uh, who came here today for the, uh, the third Snowplow Meetup New York. It's, uh, it's fantastic to see you all, all here. We're really excited about today's event and um, we've got some excellent speakers from, uh, from Datadog and Capital One talking. Uh, my name's Yali. I'm one of the co-founders at, at, at Snowplow and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you in, in New York. Um, I'm especially grateful that you've all come on such a beautiful, uh, sunny, uh, sunny day to spend the evening with us. Um, let's, let's kick straight off. Uh, so the first uh, speaker is um, Offman from Datadog, who's going to tell us a little bit about what Datadog do with their Snowplow data. Thank you, Offman. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for being here. My name is Othman. I'm a data engineer in the internal analytics team here at Datadog. And I will be talking about uh, how we use Snowplow at Datadog for uh, internal analytics. So the way we, we, I'll be structuring this more presentation is that I will be starting with giving like some uh, context and general overview of our team and the work we do here at Datadog. And then I'll talk about some interesting use cases that we have uh, for Snowplow uh, in our team. And then I'll focus a little bit more about uh, how we architecture our pipeline and how we make uh, like this whole thing work, starting from the data that we get from Snowplow until like these different use cases that we will talk about. So basically our team is like Lava Cake. Uh, Lava Cake because all teams at Datadog have uh, food names. And what we do is basically internal analytics. We provide all the other teams internally with the data that they need to answer specific business questions. So our mission is uh, to centralize all the data across the company and uh, provide this data to different other teams. This can go from like sales or marketing teams that want to understand how we are generating leads and what's the whole workflow for leads uh, from lead generation until the moment where we close a new deal until like product managers or engineers who, wanna, who want to better understand how our end, user are, uh, end users are interacting with our application. So the idea is to be able to provide them uh, with the right data uh, to help them answer like specific business questions either like through uh, dashboards that we'll be building for them or uh, by allowing them to use the data on their end. And one of our main focus this quarter has been to uh, improve the visibility into uh, product health adoption and the way end users uh, interact with our application. And uh, using Snowplow has been uh, super useful in order to do that. In terms of data sources, we ingest currently data from more than 40 different data sources. Uh, obviously one of them is Snowplow, but we get also a lot of data from AWS S3, uh, Redshift where basically other teams can provide us with extracts that will uh, allow us, for example, to get uh, app usage for our customers. We also uh, get a lot of data from different APIs. This can be like Salesforce or Marketo for marketing or like sales specific data. Uh, we also talk to PagerDuty and SE ranking to get uh, data about uh, our, uh, about SRE or our search engine uh, optimization. The idea is that we will be trying to get and getting data from uh, all the possible data sources to be able to push them together and uh, create value by integrating th these different data together. The data that we provide is uh, diverse. Uh, it can be like app usage data, for example, if you want to know for specific orgs, how many hosts they're running, like their container usage, uh, the metrics that they're using. We'll be also tracking all the in-app and the corpse site traffic, maybe through Snowplow. And based on that, we will be able to build uh, models that will allow us to attribute signups to different marketing efforts to different teams. And based on that, we will be doing revenue attribution and we will be evaluating uh, the performance of different marketing efforts. So the general overview of how the whole thing works is that we will be getting data from different data sources. We will be uh, 
uh, processing this data through our ETL pipeline in the data engineering side. And uh, once our data is ready, we will be uh, loading it into our data warehouse in AWS Redshift. And we will be plugging Looker on top of it to be able to either provide like this data through dashboards that are built for specific teams to answer specific questions, or like just to allow end users to be able to explore this data and based on the different objects that we have in different models, uh, give them the ability to like explore and answer questions that they may have. The third part of it uh, on which we don't do a lot of work currently, but on which we're planning to start working more and more over the next month and quarters is to be able to uh, do some machine learning and data science around the data that we collect in order to create and to extract even more value from it. So now I will be focusing on uh, two of the use cases that we have for Snowplow uh, internally uh, in Datadog. The idea is that Snowplow allows us to uh, track uh, traffic that we generate from our corp sites and from our application. And these two aspects of the Snowplow data that we extract will uh, have like different nature. Like the first one is, the uh, first idea is that basically the corp site, it will be interesting for us to track all the journey for our customers before even they sign up for Datadog. This will mainly uh, allow us to see like uh, on which landing pages they landed because they were scanned at an event or because they clicked on an online ad. It will also allow us to understand how people were interacting with the different like pricing pages, for example, before even they decide to sign up for uh, Datadog. Once they signed up, the idea is that we will be able to track their in-app traffic in order to better understand the way they interact with the application, the different categories, features that they are interested on and on which they are spending time. The third dimension is both prior and after the sign up. We have like a lot of content that we put out there in blogs or documentation. And the idea is that the snowplow data that we, uh, that, 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 that we extract and that we build will also allow us to understand how uh, our users or just regular visitors are interacting with like our blog posts, with our documentations <laughs> and other resources that we put out there. So one of the two interesting use cases that we have for this data coming in from our corp sites and our application uh, is basically signups and revenue attribution. And I will be also talking a little bit about an in-app feature that we are building based on uh, this data that I, uh, we were talking about earlier. So in terms of signup and revenue attribution, the basic question and the basic idea is like pretty straightforward. We want to be able to understand, to, to get like a customer and understand how this specific sign up was generated and how we will split uh, this sign up among different uh, marketing efforts. The idea is that based on uh, these different data points that we track through the customer journey, we will be able to say, okay, this sign up should be attributed to 20% to events. It should be attributed to 25% to online ads, etc. And based on that, we'll be also able to uh, affect revenue that we generate from these accounts into specific like marketing efforts and hence be able to calculate like payback for different uh, campaigns. And the idea there is that this can also be uh, extremely useful in like an operational context where we want to optimize, for example, uh, online ads to generate like signups that will tend to uh, generate like high revenue. The second use case uh, that I'll be talking about today about for, for the Snowplow data is basically an in-app feature that we're building based on the data that we collect from the application. And the idea is for us to build in-app features that will enhance uh, the way uh, our end users surf in dashboards. We will be extracting uh, usage data for like different users in all the dashboards that are related to their account. And we will be suggesting based on that a number of like related dashboards that might interest them because they've seen other dashboards. We will be at the dashboard level suggesting like top users in case like uh, a specific user has a question about how a dashboard or monitor is built. And we will also be able to sort like the monitor, the dashboards and the different pages by popularity inside <laughs> a customer's account. 
And another interesting use case is that we will also allow users to see if they have like dashboards that basically nobody uh, end up using. Now for the third part of uh, this presentation, I will be uh, talking a little bit more about the technical aspects uh, behind uh, the data that we build in order to be able to answer these questions and these two use cases that I was talking about. So the general overview of the architecture of our pipeline uh, is divided into uh, basically three layers. The first layer is what we call the bronze layer. It's basically the bronze extract is for us the raw data as it's coming from its source. It can be like an S3 extract generated from uh, the billing team. It can be a uh, usage summary for like during a day coming from uh, for a certain number of orgs. The idea is that in bronze, we won't be doing any transformation. We want to keep all the data, even if it's for now uh, not directly used in, our, uh, in the next layers. Once we have the data in bronze, the idea is that we will be building the next layer that will be silver. In silver, we will uh, basically be applying some like general uh, cleaning to the bronze data. This is like uh, column renaming. Uh, we will do some general transformations and we will apply all the filters and all the row level based operation. The idea is that we will have a one-on-one -on -one mapping between bronze and silver to a single bronze uh, extract. We will map a single silver extract that will contain the columns that we really care about and that will do some like uh, basic cleaning on top of it. Once we have our silver file, silver layer and our silver files, we will move to the next layer that's basically gold. And gold is like where all the magic will happen. Between bronze and silver, we have one-on-one -on -one mapping. In gold, we can require one or silver, silver, silver objects or tasks, but also we can use other gold tasks. And the idea is that in gold, we will be building the final object that will be loaded eventually into our data warehouse and that will be used by our end users to be able to run queries and like answer questions about our like different aspects of our business. Based on this architecture, here you have like a view of uh, a dependency graph of our pipeline. The idea is that you have like around here all the bronze layer. And then as you can see, you have like this one-on-one -on -one mapping between bronze and silver. And things get generally a little bit more complicated than gold where you can have like different dependencies. So here you have like one dimension of the dependencies. The other one that you don't actually see in the dependency, dependency graph is that there is basically a temporal dimension in there where you could be, uh, for example, requiring data from a specific layer in a specific time frame. And depending on the data that you're building and on the question that you're answering, we will uh, end up either requiring, uh, let's say data for only the most recent date or like for all the history to perform a certain number of operations. So the idea is that with like a uh, certain level of complexity in our dependency graph, we need basically two things. We need a tool in order to be able to automate uh, this pipeline in order to be able to say, okay, I need this specific object for this specific data and have a way to generate all the dependencies or the things that we need in order to be able to build that object. And of course, building the project itself, processing the data and uh, being able to output uh, the extract that we need. So one of the tools that we use uh, for the first aspect of these two needs is basically Luigi. Luigi will be uh, the maestro of our pipeline. Uh, Luigi is a tool that we use uh, in order to chain and automate the tasks together and build uh, the dependency graph uh, that I was showing in the previous uh, slide. The idea is that uh, a Luigi task will be uh, pretty straightforward as uh, at the beginning, like it will only be, it will be able to like require a certain number of other tasks. It will have like an output and the way it will work is that it will check if the output exists or not. And if the output exists, it will consider that the task was successful or otherwise it will actually run the task. So this is like the general idea that can be this is like sim sim simple and pretty straightforward. But on top of that, we build like the whole backend of uh, our pipeline 
and we will be templating different type of tasks for our different bronze, silver, and gold extracts. And we will be also building like different task deciders that will handle all the logic of knowing like which task needs to be run and for which uh, time frames. So Luigi is like a powerful tool for us because it provides us with uh, the ability to have like these different uh, tiers, these different layers and these different ways of like uh, making the tasks interact uh, together. It allows us to build this dependency graph and the other super interesting idea is that when we have failures in our pipeline, thanks to Luigi and this uh, logic by which a task will be run or not based on the output being uh, existing or not or other custom logic that we can put in there, we will be able to resume uh, the data workflow after we have like something failing in the pipeline. The other interesting aspect too is that we have like a pretty clean command line integration that allow us to uh, easily uh, run specific tasks and uh, get rapidly the data that we need. So here for now we have with Luigi uh, this maestro that will uh, distribute things, this brain that will decide what needs to be run in order to get where we want to get. But we still basically need a hard worker, someone who will uh, do all the heavy lifting around the data. And for that, we'll be, we, we will use Spark. We basically use Spark to clean these different data that we get, to process it, and to create all the intermediates and the final objects uh, that we will be uh, using in our data mart. Spark is like a very good option for us uh, for several reasons. Uh, the first one is the fact that Spark will be like pretty fast for our use cases, and it has this general purpose. Uh, the idea is that we have a very powerful integrations with other tools that we use like AWS S3, uh, Redshift, and we will be uh, basically extending the MapReduce uh, uh, model and this will allow us to process some very important like uh, amount of data and be able to get it to uh, a level where we have like the right roll up that we will push into our data warehouse uh, so queries like uh, give me the house count during this month for a certain org can be uh, pretty straightforward and uh, easy to get. The Spark stack is uh, basically organized around the Spark core that will hold uh, the computational engine that will take care, all, take care of all the scheduling and the distribution of the different tasks and the executors. And the idea is that we will be able to use all these integrations with the highest level components uh, like Spark SQL or MLib in order to be able to build like, for example, machine learning models and integrate them into our pipeline. So the idea is that we will be trying to put all the heavy logic in the data engineering part and we will basically push into our Redshift cluster the data that can directly be used by our end users. Once the data is in Redshift, we will be building like dashboards on top of it, allowing uh, people to run SQL queries or to explore the data through Looker. And we will try to minimize the amount of computation that we will be uh, doing in Redshift. The idea is that all the heavy logic of the pipeline should live in the data engineering part. All uh, the intelligence, all the models should live in the data science and the machine learning parts. And the analytics part should basically be uh, joining data, accessing data, and reading data from uh, Redshift. So thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel, more, feel free to uh, ask them. This is basically the first talk I gave. So if you have like any feedback for me, feel free. <laughs> uh, there is my email up there. So we have uh, full mic. Um, did you evaluate any other workflow management tools besides Luigi, like Airflow? So uh, we're not the only team inside the company uh, which is currently using Luigi, <laughs> but with like the other teams that are currently using Luigi for product facing uh, data engineering uh, tools. Yeah. So I was saying that we are not the only team who is using Luigi internally in the company. Uh, we have other teams that are who, whose work is more like the 
customer facing data engineering who are also using Luigi. And yeah, we've been evaluating uh, Airflow. But if we decide at some point to move to Airflow, it will probably be like a company-wide decision and we won't be the only ones making this decision or making the move. But yeah, we'll be, we've been like talking about it and thinking about it for quite some time now. Thank you. And I think we had a question. Where was it? Well, I have the same question. Oh, <laughs> well then that was easy. Anybody else? You, ready? Um, you talked a bit about the, uh, I think the second use case you gave was about uh, dashboard recommendation and um, take, taking the data that you're collecting and using it to improve the, 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 the product experience. Are you using machine learning there? And, and if, if so, what kind of approaches are you taking? So this isn't something that we've been doing in our team. Uh, in our team, we've been just building the data and this data science team took care of all uh, the data science part. What we have built so far and what's in beta so far is uh, basically just doing associations between uh, different, uh, uh, I, I mean, we've been building uh, popularity scores for different dashboards for specific users and building associations on top of them to be able to, uh, I mean, push specific dashboards for specific users and specific dashboards for specific customers. And then a, an unrelated question. In the transformations that you're running, the bronze, silver, and gold to get your data into the, the finalized state for your data warehouse, how fast evolving is that process? Is, is that process fairly static? Or are you evolving the structure of the data in, in the data warehouse as you're pulling in more sources and as the, the business is asking more questions of the data? So, yeah, obviously things tend to rapidly evolve but the way we organize this uh we, we basically use the star schema and we will have like these fact tables that will for example contain all the page views right and then we will create dim tables that will contain all these like rapidly evolving dimensions for example tomorrow we can end up having like new page category or new feature in our app and the idea is that this uh, the page feature part will live in a separate team table that we will be joining to the main table like through an ID. And if we need to add an additional feature, we won't have like to rerun this to end to backfill the whole history. We will be only modifying like the small team table where we put all these rapidly evolving dimensions. Maybe as a follow-up question, and by the way, you did a great job. <clears throat> How um, fast does the end-to-end -end pipeline actually run? Is this it's, it sounded like it's daily batches or is it streaming? How quickly does data come into the bronze tier and end up in the gold tier? So for now, we run the pipeline daily. Uh, it runs every night and it takes between like three to four hours to run. And then you mentioned that the heavy lifting is done really in the bronze tier, if I recall. Um, what does the, the, the change time look like for whether it be data science or your team to incorporate more sophisticated logic so that the people who are using Looker on the front end can perform more complex analysis? So the heavy logic will more leave in gold than in bronze, because like basically bronze is just a copy of the initial data, and then all the heavy logic will be in gold. So the idea is that we always have a balance to find between like uh, doing like vertical and horizontal uh, growth, because like we will always have a new request for new data sets. We'll always be adding new features, uh, new pages in our app. And there's like this aspect of just being able to cover like more and more ground. And at the same time, we're also planning on spending more and more time building like uh, extracting more value from this data. So again, it's a matter of prioritization to understand how much time we'll be spending expanding the existing versus uh, adding more complex logic to allow like extracting more insights from the existing data that we have in there. So I, I take it, it it's a, there is a prioritization there. It does take days, weeks, and so on to get those changes into the pipeline and built and so on. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, had a question about um, what looks like more of a traditional ETL infrastructure where the people, the consumers of your data are only seeing the dimensions and facts at the very end. And I'm wondering, it, as opposed to like uh, more recent, like ELT, where you load everything, 
uh, and I'm wondering about your data consumers and if you find that they are frustrated with that setup and are demanding more access to the raw data or if that setup's working perfectly fine for you. I mean, the answer to that question really depends on the population with whom we're talking. Like, uh, the idea of our team is that we will be working with like almost every single team internally and they will have like different technical background. Like with engineers, we will tend to provide them directly with access to probably not the raw data, but at least the data as it is in gold. And they will be directly be extracting it from our S3 buckets and doing whatever they need like as a complex logic on their end. The idea of the ETL pipeline as it exists and the data as we load it in the Redshift uh, cluster and the way we expose it in Looker is that it will allow let's say like less technical users to still be able to answer specific questions and they will eventually hit the limits of the model as it is. And in that case, it might just be that they should like move to the next phase and dig a little bit further, like eventually using other tools. And we're also evaluating like otherwise or other ways of delivering this data for other teams. But for now, we're still trying to drive more and more usage in like this traditional workflow. And we're obviously exploring things like around the edges. Yeah. Um, Where's the song? Right. Thank you. How do you handle skew in your data? So let's say like, you know, your, your uh, data providers, all of a sudden, the amount of data that goes really high. Is your pipeline able to accommodate that? Is it automatically able to spin out, spin up more uh, like executor nodes on the spot on spark or that hasn't happened or like what's the strategy around that? Like obviously it happens. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, we have uh, tools in place to be able to handle like these kind of things. And uh, yeah, basically we're able to, uh, for example, upsize our clusters in order to be able to like run more data. We have like specific tools in place to tune specific configurations for specific Spark jobs uh, to handle like edge cases with like skewed joins, things like that. And the other like important thing also relates to the way we design the objects to start with. Uh, like the idea is uh, depending on the amount of data and like the the final question that we are trying to answer, we will be processing more or less data and we will always try to make like the right call that will maximize uh, the value that we're creating from data and at the same time, keeping like all uh, the data engineering like problems uh, limited. So yeah, the answer to that is that yes, we, we have like ways to solve these kind of issues, but the general approach isn't just to like throw more compute powers into the problems, which I also to redesign things and to think them accordingly, uh, not to be over-engineering our solutions. Uh, you mentioned you were beginning to look at tools that go beyond the, more, the, the traditional re reporting and, and data exploration. What are some examples of those tools and, and what types of uh, investigation or analysis are not being met you know, today with the tools that you have? So, uh, I mean, an aspect for that, I'll give like two examples of that. Like the first one is uh, basically for a very long time, we've been asking other teams to come to our tools in order to be able to use our data. So for someone at Datadog to be able to see the internal analytics data, they will need to go through Looker to like explore the data from our Redshift cluster. What we've been trying to do is to embed like this data into native tools of other teams. We will be embedding data in Salesforce, for example, we're working with the support team to be able to embed data into Zendesk. This is like the first aspect of it. The second one is uh, basically when we're, when we're working with other engineering teams, they will be eventually invited to extract the data directly from some S3 interface bucket that we have with them. And we will be providing the like specific extract with the right granularity to allow them to perform like the right queries that the, 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 the right jobs that they need on their end. And maybe another aspect of that is that you're also evaluating some other tools like Airtable for let's say less technical users or like people who will have uh, like very specific questions that will, they will want to like answer uh, more easily but like more repeatedly. In that case, maybe like Airtable on top of a Google Sheet might be enough. So this is also something that we're exploring right now. I think we're going to need to um, uh, to thank Offman for uh, a, a, a fantastic 
a fantastic talk and a, and, and a first talk. Thank you very much. There's a really, there's a really great questions. Um, 